So I really want to share my passion with you today. Um, and my passion, in addition to my kids, is to visualize data. So I'm going to borrow um, an example from 73, Francis Hanscom, uh, statistician. And he put together this amazing example of what is visualization for. So those kind of four series of two numbers, they're kind of amazing because if you compute basic stats about them, the average, standard deviation, regression line, they're all equivalent, they're all the same numbers. So you could conclude those four series of X and Y coordinates are kind of the same. Yet if you plot them, you would see they differ in some radical different ways, right? And that's the power of visualization. What's interesting is another statistician put together the updated version in 2017, uh, kind of showing all of those different plots that you could see there also have the same basic stats. So that's really revealing the power of visualization. Visualization helps you answer a question you did not even know you had. So it's about generating hypotheses. Of course, you still need statistics and all of those complex algorithms to actually answer those questions and really know if this is significant or not, the pattern you see in the data. But visualization has this unique power to just make you think what else could be there and ask the right questions. Now, I'm with Microsoft, and Microsoft has always been a big player in data viz. I mean, you probably all know Excel. Um, there's lots of visualization in there. Um, there's also Power BI, that tool for more advanced analytics. You can interact with your data. You can create those dashboards. Well, I'm not part of those um, product teams, but I have really tight interaction with them. I'm very lucky to be part of Microsoft Research. We're kind of unique, I think, in um, industry research and probably just in the world. There were 2,000 people, uh, researcher, engineers, and we're just given complete freedom to do research whatever we want. I love my job. Um, lots of our ideas actually transfer to like products tomorrow. You're going to see re things from research out there on our products. But we also research 5, 10, and 20 years down the line. Um, and some of our ideas never made it anywhere, but we're still happy to have them um, out. So I want to share with you a few of those amazing projects we're doing around visualization. And I'm going to try to show, showcase kind of um, ideas that have made it to the product and ideas that are just coming up right now. So the first project I wanted to showcase is by Curtis Wong. So research project that was initiated a few years back, and it actually is shipping with Excel right now, so you can visualize your data as a map with some two and a half dimension. You can make tours, and you can create amazing presentation with that. So available in Excel now. Um, a really recent one is a custom visual for Power BI, so if you install it, you can actually have it right now with your Power BI data, and it allows you to uh, to kind of animate every single point is, um, in, in your data record is a little point on your screen and you can animate in between views. More out there research that has not yet made it to the product um, is kind of trying to tackle the new devices we have, such as the Surface Hub, who has this amazing you know, digital pen and touch. So you can actually use the pen to create uh, charts and then interact with them and annotate them. So think with your data and then present it. And then finally, more uh, recent research is about trying to uncover what 3D visualization can give you and what can we do, what are compelling scenarios we could use to visualize data using virtual reality headset and the Microsoft HoloLens, for example. So all of those amazing um, projects have been done by a lot of colleagues of ours in Microsoft Research, but I'm here today to talk about my research, which I'm even more excited. Um, and that's about a second superpower of visualization. Once you have found all of those trends, those relations, those outliers, those clusters, you want to share it with an audience like you guys, uh, or maybe with my mom. Um, and so that's where visualization comes from. You can actually communicate very effectively a message with visualization. And in fact, those stories with data are everywhere. You know, chances are you've seen one of those infographics on your social media, or you were just browsing the New York Times, and then you end up in one of those amazing interactive data graphics that tells you a story about the news today. So as a researcher, I want to understand what are those stories made of? 
What are the visualization components that are compelling, that are not misleading, that are truthful to the data, that are easily understood? And what are the narratives that guide you through that story so you're not lost and you're getting the point across? But being at Microsoft, we want to uncover, empower anyone to actually build those stories. So you don't have to be a graphic designer to do an infographic. You don't have to be a programmer to do one of those amazing interactive visualizations. Ideally, my kids could do it. So I'm going to share with you two, two particular projects. Um, the first one is about making data-driven animations and videos. And I'm going to start with just thinking about a timeline. So we started that project thinking, we have those timelines everywhere. Um, like this is the very first edition of a timeline from the 1700s. Um, and we don't have anything to visualize it or to tell the story about it. So as a researcher, what we did is looking at all of the different timelines you can find. Dig through, archive, look at the latest thing we can find, and then trying to classify those timelines by what sort of characteristic they have. So for example, the timeline I showed you to show the life of different philosophers, it's just what you think probably when I say timeline. Just an horizontal line flowing from left to right, and then I mark the, the, lift, the lives of um, famous people on top of it. But if I want to show you, you know, what happened in the day of one famous writer, um, I may want to actually wrap the timeline around the clock to kind of convey the idea of what was he doing during this day. And basically, that's the beauty of timelines. There's many different types, many different layouts, many different ways to encode the time. And so we uncover this just amazing space of design. And I'm just going to show you an example of how one particular configuration, one particular visualization can help you tell a story. So let's look at the life of creative famous people like Ludwig van Beethoven. So I wrapped his day around a circle, and you could see I have like, you know, the blue area is where he slept. Maybe what I want to say is, hey, look at the time where he was creative in his day. So what I would do is simply just uncover all of the other ones. Now, maybe I want to compare it to another famous person like Charles Darwin. But really, if I want to compare what their day was like, I probably want to have them on a line on top of each other. And if I want to show you, you know, how, when they were doing their creative work, I want to get rid of all of the unnecessary information. And I'll show you that Charles Darwin is my ideal type job. Three hours <laughs> of your day. And you still do amazing research, right? So now what I just showed you there, this little animation, um, that's one part of my job. The second part, as I told you earlier, is try to empower anyone to build this. So I'm going to show you a brief demo of what's existing right now in Power BI, and you can use it today. It's available, open source, you can try it, um, and have fun with it. So if you recall, all of that, um, that research we did was trying to categorize the different type of layouts. So for example, circular, linear, but also many other characteristic of timelines, such as changing the type of scale of the time that we're representing. And so we basically build everything into a digital version of it, where you just load your data in and you can explore all of those different configurations that we found. Now, to create the story, you, first, you can use just, this is a screenshot of Power BI, just load your data in and then drag and drop different fields to encode different facets of your data, such as the different people that were in the famous people one or the different phases of their day. And just drag and drop that data and it automatically creates those visualizations for you. And then as you tell your story, you need to have annotations. You need to add labels, you need to add images. Uh, here I'm just grabbing some images from uh, my laptop. You need to add titles. So all of that, we have to build into an authoring tool that helps you create those unique scenes. And you record them as you would just create a new slide. And finally, the last step is you just play them together. And part of our research is try to build animations that help you go from one to the other, so from any configuration to another one, and go back and forth. So that's the first project that I shared with you that actually made it into a product. 
Um, it's now available, anyone can download it. Like the first time I saw so many emails, I freaked out, to be honest. Um, but I want to share with you the second project, who no one else has seen yet. I don't know where it's going to go, but I really love it. So that project, um, just really the idea was about this new device that we have. I just so wanted one, finally, in my office. It's the Surfer Studio. It's like high res. You have this pen. You, you can touch it. It's just gorgeous. And I was like, we have to have some compelling visualization to do with this. And you know, this part of my brain, the left side, was thinking Power BI, and the right side took over and was thinking we can do art. Now, with my daughter, we went to uh, New York, to the MoMA, and I saw this exhibition, Dear Data exhibition. It's amazing. I think it's down now, but you can still buy the book. And it's two graphics designers who actually collected data about their life, and then they actually hand drew a postcard every week about that data, and then they send it to each other. And so they ended up with, for example, these amazing drawings of the dogs they encountered in their week. Um, and the back of the postcard is actually the legend. So it's a really fascinating project. And my right side brain thought, we can totally do something really cool with this Surface Studio and you know, enable people to actually draw the data they are collecting. And so we ended up with this software. So imagine I have all of this data set of dogs that I've seen. So I'm just going to draw a dog, and I'm going to duplicate it for every row in my data set, all of the dog that I've seen. Now, if I tap it, I can see all of the data that's available to me, such as the color of that dog, was it in a bag, or did it have a leash? I can unlock the different visual channel I can use to encode the data, such as the field color. I want to color all of the dog that are brown, brown, and then the one that are black, black. So I'm going to bind it to that data attribute that I have. And I can just do that with pen and touch right now. Now, as you see, only a couple of the dogs move because that's the dog that have the data attribute that is brown. And I can continue and do this through the back of the postcard, which is the legend. So I can just set a color for every single um, dog that I have in my data set. Now, when I do um, also the, 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 the layout, I may want to group those dogs by different um, other attributes. For example, here, I'm just grouping them by the length of their fur. And I was thinking, maybe I'll do some sort of histogram. That would be cool with all of my little dogs. So what I can do is just grab them. Um, because they're data binded, I could just grab all of the different fur lengths. And I can easily create whatever visualization I want. I hope you see all of the right side of my brain was also active there. Um, and I can do those amazing drawings in really um, a few minutes, just with pen and touch, just grabbing my data set, putting it in there, um, and ended up with like maybe the basis for an infographics. Now, the next step um, is to add a lot of those um, drawings with you know, additional way to author the text, maybe some animation, maybe making them into more like a comics, uh, where I can really tell a story about my data. Um, for example, wouldn't it be cool if I download the data, the sleep data from my band, and I can just share it with people to explain uh, how is my day, make it some personal infographics things. So basically, that's what I'm doing for my job. And that's the end. <laughs> and I hope you have lots of questions for me, and I'd love to connect other different times. <laughs> yes, we did. So like, the question was, did we connect with the artist? So we connected with uh, Georgia Lupi. She's in uh, New York, actually. And um, yeah, it's been amazing. We just started. We're trying to see if we could do um, companion exhibit to what she has in uh, the BOMA. It's been really nice. Yeah. What kinds of data are you finding the most challenging to visualize? Haha. <laughs> so the big thing usually is big data. But actually, I say complex data. And complex data could be small. Um, so early on, um, 
maybe 10 years ago, I was working with complex networks, the type of um, networks that um, someone from Facebook was presenting uh, before. So those are very um, challenging because they, they're uh, very intricate. They have lots of different facets. So I would say graph data, they evolve over time. Sometimes there are also a lot of them. Um, then I worked a lot with um, fMRI data, so how your neurons connect you know, from, um, in, the, in the medical domain, where there's lots of noise, no one knows what it's doing. Um, so that's the most challenging type. Actually, the question was sort of similar, so I'm going to ask the other side of the coin question, which is big data. So what about uh, how much data can be processed with that kind of visualization? So in general, for visualization, for communication, you want to break it down. Or you want to actually show so much data, but your message should be it's complex and it's big. So that's actually uh, very challenging, because even what we call small data, like over 100 points, is already difficult when I'm giving a presentation. Um, so that's, the, um, that's kind of the, the, the answer is, you know, already if you have over, like too many to talk about, like, you know, I don't want to have one slide and then talk about it for five minutes because you guys are just going to sleep. Um, so I have to break it down even smaller one. So now when we talk about huge, you know, like millions, uh, we have to find some other, um, some other way to deal with it. So break it down, showing some sort of summary stats. Um, for the example that you showed in Power BI, that where your ideas are actually in the product, have you yep. gotten product information back about how people are using it or learned anything yeah. That's surprising? Yeah, too many. No. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So um, that's what's great about being part of that company. Like the first day we put it online, we had 20,000 people trying it. Um, we're just dealing with that data right now. I mean, there's a lot of issues we know already. Uh, we kind of went in also, you know, with the research mindset, thinking, ah, people wouldn't know how to choose, for example, the, the type of scale. So we need to come up with some ways to, like, guide them in their choices, like, suggestions. But we kind of knew that ahead. We just wanted to see whether we were right or wrong. Um, so, yeah, and we have a lot of that information. Um, it's kind of challenging because we have low-level information, like, who clicks where. So we need to write visualization software to explore that data. <laughs> my job is never ending. Um, I'm making my own job, you know, like worse. Um, but yeah, that's very exciting. Right. One last question. Um, I work with students here at Stanford, and I love this, uh, this idea of getting populations who don't typically drift to this area interested. One of the challenges is opportunities for them to experience it in a small dose before they declare their major. So I'm curious what kinds of tools you're developing so that people can learn how to do what you're doing um, with Surface or with other tools um, in an experiential way. Yeah, that's a... I mean, that's kind of my passion in life as well. So I started a project, I couldn't squeeze it in there, uh, but with kindergartners, because that's my kids' age, um, where, you know, I got in class and then I got uh, them some apps that they could just download on their surface and then they can just play with it and transform their data. So there's nothing really out there yet. Um, I think lots of researchers place their project online so people could try them. And a lot of those projects could fit this, I think. But it's, there's no central location. And um, those projects are uh, also break easily. But I think trying to put together a curriculum for this would be great. Wonderful. So we can connect later. Great. Well, on that note, thank you so much, uh, Nazli, again. Merci très beaucoup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>